Good afternoon and welcome to episode two of Behind the Bearcat with Northwest Career Services, uh, where we chat with different folks from Northwest Missouri State University to find out how they got here, advice they have for students and all of that. So uh, my name is Travis Klein. I'm the internship coordinator with Career Services, and I'm joined by Hannah Christian. Hi, guys. I'm Hannah Christian, the assistant director of Career Services. And we are very pleased today to have our first guest, uh, our Director of Partnerships and Placement here at Northwest, Ms. Jill Brown. Jill Brown. Thank you. I'm excited to be your first guest. (laughs) All right. So our first episode, Hannah and I kind of introduced ourselves, kind of where we came from, how we got to Northwest, and how we got in our positions. So So now I'm going to grill you about all of those things. So my very first question, see, I'm already banging on the table again. (laughs) I'm already going to have to stop that habit. My very first question is, as director of partnerships and placement, what do you actually do in your job? Right. My job is a little bit of everything. So within that realm of that job opportunity, that means that I handle all things partnerships. So what that means is when it's a partner who wants to partner with a classroom or with a club or with an organization or with Northwest in general, usually I meet with them to talk about what those opportunities are and then try to create general collisions between what an employer or an organization might like with what we're actually doing here. So so this is integrating. So when you say partnerships with a classroom, what is that? Like, who's going to partner with the classroom? So usually what I say to employers is, what is the 10th thing on your to-do list? What are you never getting to at your job? And depending on what they say, a lot of times it's, oh, we'd like to do more social media, or we wish we had a better database system. Then I usually say back to them, well, we got a class who works on that. Would you consider letting them be your your client, letting them work on this project for you? And as you might imagine, most employers say, yes, please, absolutely, free labor. Gotcha. Um, and so then finding those kind of partnerships and making sure that they're mutually beneficial for both the students here at Northwest as well as those companies. Okay, so placement. Placement, right? We want to make sure that all of our Bearcats are indeed employed at the point of graduation. So under my bandwidth, and obviously is working as your director here in Career Services, which really means uh, that I just get to watch the awesome work that both of you do. Yeah, I was going to say, okay, so (laughs) this is kind of my commercial for myself. What do you actually do with placement, Right? Yeah, I'm not going to touch that placement report. That's all Hannah. (laughs) So I more see my job as Career Services in that director type role of just more trying to aligned to the other priorities on campus, looking for those opportunities, whether they're within our other campus partners or our outside campus partners, and really just letting you all do what you do best and trying to, you know, stay out of the way in a sense. That way we're all driving our own lanes, but we're all headed in the same direction. And I I would also add to that, I think, making sure that that placement information doesn't get lost in other, you know, other types of communication. So with those partners, hey, we're successful You know, how can we place our Bearcats who just worked for you, right, on this project? Absolutely. And as you know, we have so much more we can grow in that space, too, because I'm not sure we've ever taken a holistic look at, well, we used to place this many Bearcats with this company in Des Moines, and we haven't done that in five years. Why is that the case? I don't think we've ever actually looked at the data in that manner. We look at it in terms of, do they all have jobs? Awesome. That is great. And that is our number one priority. But as we get further into all that data collection, I'd love to look more at, who are our longstanding partners? Who have been our best advocates for hiring Bearcats? Are those the same people? Do they change? Why do they change? What happens? Maybe they just don't have openings. Maybe they've kept our Bearcats, which is awesome. So you don't ever want to just kick somebody out of the pool just because they haven't come or offered an internship or full-time job. Just more looking at it more truly holistic. Gotcha. That's a, a really a much bigger perspective. So is that That's a good, so what does a day in the life of Jill Brown look like (laughs) as director of partnerships and placement? Right. I think that is actually what drew me to Northwest is it never is the same. So I never intend to come to work and have my whole day outlined because that is just not how this works. Today, my day has been filled with a whole lot of employer calls because with career day next week, they're calling to ask how many graduates we have in what program and who might they see at career day and could they meet with this professor ahead of time? And why do I have to pay $15 for an extra lunch ticket? Right, why why, why do you want to feed me? (laughs) Um, Things along those lines. And at the same time, also working on like huge university priorities and trying to figure out how do you budget your time? How do you really budget your brain space a lot of times more with me? That way all the tactical to-dos don't get lost in terms of some of those bigger priorities. And then having to come on a podcast in the middle of all of that, right? It was a nice reprieve. (laughs) So one of the things you've been charged with here at Northwest is profession-based learning. And we use that term all the time. 
what does that actually mean to maybe folks who are listening who have heard it, but they don't actually know what that really means in real life? Absolutely. So the way I try to explain it to employers, which hopefully also makes sense to students, is if you're in a marketing class and they're going to give you the widget factory of Wisconsin and make you solve a problem, that's great. But if we have Kawasaki here in town, why would we not want to solve a real problem? So profession-based learning is really getting at that how much real-world, real-time effort can we get into our courses, into our clubs, into our organizations? And we know we've been doing that a long time here, but just like I mentioned with that in student data, I also want to do that with employer data. So are we still looking at the same case study, though, all these years? That's not helpful. Um, obviously, the industries change. So we spent a lot of our time since I got here also looking at who's playing with us in terms of profession-based learning. What does it look like? Who's doing the best job? Where are there opportunities for growth? It's definitely one of those areas that I would say is very amoeba-ish. And that Constantly it can, moving, it can changing. Const- and it should because it's profession-based learning. So your profession's change, so this should change too. But sometimes it's a little hard to put it in nice, neat quadrants like yeah. I would like to do. Like a degree, right? So, yeah. so, so jobs and degrees don't often match up, right? So you can have different people. I mean, gosh, I was not a media student. I was a biology student. But knowing, hey, maybe I want to start a podcast about plants, right? Mm-hmm. So then knowing I can partner with somebody in a media space or something. Absolutely. And that's honestly what I what drew me to Northwest about profession-based learning was to me, it's, it's I saw it as a way to test drive a whole lot more careers rather than just an internship. I'm a big advocate of internships. I want students to do a whole bunch of them. But I also like PBL because it's like little short-term internships. Like, well, I did that podcast and I hated it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, or, oh, I had to do that biology project. I really don't like looking at samples. Whatever the case might be, what I'm hoping is that, shoot, 5, 10, 15 years from now, we become so much more prescriptive with our education course offerings through profession-based learning that our students not only get a better first job, they're also still in that job a couple years out because they were had a good fit. They liked where they were. They were using their best skills. Gotcha. Right. So one of the things we talked about was kind of our first jobs and kind of the career trajectory because I'm sure you didn't you know, in high school and they said, what do you want to be? You didn't say, I want to be director of partnerships. Nobody says, I want to be director of this. I want to be career service person. They do person. not. So <laughs> for what good did reason. You, what did you start with? What was your first job? My my first paid job. And I, I always say, okay, let me give everyone the definition. My uh-huh, definition of job. your first, first job is you have to be paid for the work that you do and it cannot be paid by your parents. So somebody besides your parents are paying you to do some work. Right. So. Well, my, that'd be worse though for me. That was my grandparents. So oh. my one grandmother <laughs> ran a catering company. My other grandparents ran a radio station. So by default, I work for both of them. So I don't know if that's worse working for your grandparents than your parents. Um, but my first, I don't know. my first true paid job was detasseling corn, like every good Nebraska kid should do. So that was my first real Paid the job. real bottom rung of the ladder there. Absolutely. Right? But, you know, I quickly rose myself to being the foreman, <laughs> which meant just, you know, yelling at my brother and his friends all day. So it was not a bad gig. Okay. So detasseling corn in high school. In Is high that school. what you were? Correct. Um, okay. So what about when you went to college? So when I went to college, I was very fortunate that I had been a state FFA officer. And so then they gave me the opportunity to work for the FFA for a number of years. So I did that my freshman and sophomore year. And then literally- So what did you do with the FFA? When you say work with them, what did you do? So the biggest thing that I did is FFA in Nebraska would have been in charge of all the contests, the summer planning for the state officers. So really kind of the role I've been in the year before, but kind of like their their ambassador or their liaison or their support team in a sense. So- working on all the contest prep, all their summer camp workshops, things along those lines. It was a great job. They probably shouldn't have paid me because it was really just lots of fun all the time. <laughs> those are the best jobs, though. The ones right? that fun you get paid for. <laughs> exactly. It's a lot of late hours and a lot of, you know, teenagers, but still lots of fun. Okay, so did you work for the FFA all through college? I did not. I got my first job in actual TV because it was Valentine's Day and everybody else was busy. I was not. Uh, (laughs) So I went and ran camera for them. And then they offered me a pretty much full-time gig working for them all through college. So you were a camera operator. I was. was the first Right? I got gotcha. as a camera operator, but they immediately made me then be on TV, which was because really, you couldn't stop talking, right? right? <laughs> which is so rude to do to a radio kid, make them be on TV. Um, but I did that then for the remainder of my time. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, when you graduated from what was your degree in when you graduated from college? I then? have a bachelor's degree in agriculture b- journalism with a broadcasting emphasis. So 
Were no. you planning on staying in TV uh, or no. radio? I, Did you, what was your plan there? Right. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure I had a plan, uh, which is why I okay. said I ended up in career gotcha. services. So <laughs> when I graduated, I already had that job. Uh, and I could have kept working for them. I also applied to work for the BBC. I applied to be a cruise director. I took the law LSAT for fun because I want to go to law school. You know, just keeping all my options open. Gotcha. So did you work for the TV station after that for a while? I did. And it was like a 50% split. So I worked for them. And then I also worked for what was called the Risk Management Agency. So that was for large federal grants. So basically what I did for them was help them with their advocacy work in relation to keeping their money from the federal government. Or all of the marketing. Keeping it away from their federal yeah, Right. Try to keep the government oh, sending oh, us okay. the money. I gotcha. Keep okay. sending us the money. Um, so I'd work on all their public relations and marketing and so forth. Gotcha. So was that with the company? No. That- it's actually, uh, Risk Management Agency is still out there. They're usually zoned by area. So we oh, covered about okay. 20 states around us. Gotcha. Now, had you taken classes in grant writing and things like that in college? Or definitely. just learn by trial? Uh, definitely a lot of learn by trial. And especially my, I was housed in Ag Econ, which I always thought was funny because I barely survived Ag Econ 141. <laughs> and then I was in the building every day. Uh, so it was definitely a lot of uh, up teaching of myself. And I also found that those faculty members, once they were no longer my instructor, they were my colleagues. They're like different people. They're different right? people. Totally they were super people. helpful helping the, you know, the blonde yapper down the hall figure things out. <laughs> Okay, so while you were doing that, then, so what was the next step after that? So the next job I got, I ran into the dean of the college. He was shopping at Hobby Lobby. I don't know what he was buying there, some bedazzled, I don't even know. <laughs> uh, and he said, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I, I work for Market Journal and I work for the risk management agency. And he said, well, I think you'd rather, you should work for us in the college. Well, you got a job? I've always wanted to work for him. So I applied for a job actually to be the director of recruitment, but he I did not get that job. But then they said, do you want to be director of career services? I'd never been to career services, but I said, <laughs> sure. Uh, so then I ended up in that kind of role. We'll take a little short PSA here to say, did you go to career services, Travis? I, I did not. The only I, interaction. Neither I, did uh, I. Uh, so uh, none uh, of the actual career services right. people went to career services, which is why we now work here, because we feel it's very important that you should Absolutely. go visit them. It's why yes. we have candy and stress balls and <laughs> yes. food, because we know you should want to come visit us. Right. Do what we say, not what we do. <laughs> That's I, exactly right. I always tell students my sole interaction with career services is... Uh, fresh uh, fall of my senior year, I walked into Lampkin Arena to career day, saw how busy it was, turned around, walked, <laughs> walked out. out. Well, my that was it. My first, and this employer still comes to our career fair, so I've never told them this story. But I got an interview with Seaboard when I was like a sophomore, and I went for my interview, and they're like, "What do we do?" I'm like, "Something with C." <laughs> they're a large pork <laughs> producer. That interview was immediately over. <laughs> but I remember being like, "Why do you want to interview me? I don't even know who you are." Um, so did not do her homework. I did not do my homework. So now I definitely stress that because I felt real dumb. <laughs> okay. So then, okay. So they hired you to be director of career services. Was did. that for the whole college? What was that for? So that'd what be you... for all agriculture and natural resources. I gotcha. So at Nebraska, it's zoned by discipline. So just over that area. And then I also spent half my time out on the road doing high school recruitment visits. Gotcha. So how long did you do that? I did that about, I'd say three to four years until I, my last position at Nebraska, which was more director of external relations for the overall institute. So you were a recruiter and you were a recruiter? Yeah, very similar were, career paths. Wow. And also right? broadcast and also production. Things. Right. Wow. Don't you want to follow us? Come along. <laughs> I'm going to stay on my science, and, <laughs> science, English, and art road, I guess. <laughs> we're literally on the road. I know, right? Yeah. So, so, okay. So then you were external relations. Was well, it still for agriculture so at for ne- that college? Yeah. So at Nebraska, um, Nebraska is a research one institution. So that meant before I just worked for the College of Ag. Then I went to a different position that was over the college as well as the research arm as well as the extension oh, I arm. I gotcha. And did external relations for them. And then when somebody retired, I took over as the lobbyist for that area as well. So lobbyists, so you were in Lincoln working with the I was at the Capitol at the legislatures all the time. Rubbing the elbows. Rubbing the elbows. Always wearing polka dots so they knew who I was. <laughs> uh, and then doing a little bit of work at the federal level as well. Wow. So did that require a lot of traveling? I did. I traveled a lot in my last job, more because you visit the senators during the off season, but then more, I always wanted to visit with their constituents as well, because I didn't want to ever go to a senator and say, this is a big concern if I hadn't also heard it from their constituents, because that's pretty disingenuous in legislative land. So I spent a lot of my time more traveling around, making sure that we were doing our due diligence. 
So how did you how did you talk to constituents? Like, so how do you do that? So that's the best part about, especially in agriculture, is you can just literally pull up about any like coffee go up shop. to the farm. Oh, right, I gotcha. coffee shop, farm shows. Most of the time, if I was traveling, that's where I was visiting. I was just trying to become part of any group, and luckily, I grew up in that land, so it was a mm-hmm. real easy transition to do. But just more trying to be present and supportive. Gotcha. Okay. A lot of breakfast, a lot of small town cafes. Gotcha. <laughs> I'm a big That's why I like fan food myself, so much, right? right? <laughs> okay, so, um, so how did you come to Northwest? So my, how'd you get here? My path to Northwest is a colorful one. So I, my husband had already moved to Missouri a few years prior because we were in the process of he working at a different car dealership. He's in the auto industry, and so he moved here. But I had a great job in Nebraska, so I was like, I'm not leaving my my great job, my big girl job. I've always wanted. I always wanted to be a lobbyist. My big girl job, unless I found something that equally was challenging for me. So then I started secret shopping the various universities of Missouri, <laughs> trying to figure out who I'd want to work for, et cetera. And then it was actually my minister at church. He tried to get me on a committee, and I said, I don't, I don't live here. He's like, what do you mean you don't live here? You're here on Sundays. I was like, well, yeah, I live in Missouri on the weekends. He's like, well, that's silly. I know some people. So he connected me with some folks here at Northwest that helped me get a better grasp on really what areas I might want to plug into, really what areas I'd be the best fit for. Because before it was like like the normal interview process. We just keep putting in applications and you're like, eh, well, I don't know. So that was extremely helpful. Gotcha. So when you came here, what was your first position? Because I know director of partnerships and placement was not your first gig at Northwest. It was not. So I was working specifically on profession-based learning partnerships. So really what that one was, was as we started this conversation, like what is PBL? And that's literally when I got here day one, I was like, well, what is PBL? (laughs) How do you all define PBL? What do you want me to do? So I felt like I spent those first couple months just trying to literally get out a whole bunch, both with our external audiences who have always been good partners. Bearcats are so extremely loyal. It was so fun. And it still is fun to do my job because Bearcats will always like, you call and they immediately want to partner because they want to pay homage to their alma mater, which is awesome. And so more trying to do that. And then it kind of just evolved into, as with any new job, and then this, and then this, and then this, and and then this. I gotcha. (laughs) As you know. Yeah. (laughs) Right. I know because I've, it's evolved. It's always (laughs) evolving. Right. (laughs) Okay, so so that's Jill from Detasseling Corn all the <laughs> way up to Director of Partnerships and Placement. So as I asked Travis, so he kind of talked a little bit about he he thinks that his his secret sauce was having a phone interview before mm. he came mm-hmm. in and had the face to face interview. So when it comes to looking for a job or getting a job, if anyone who is listening is in that sort of transition time, what are some key points or tips or pointers that you could give someone that that might have helped you? I always think that I owe so much to people who are looking out for me. So in other words, I've always worked my network. I network all the time. But I also had a great network who was working for me. So even though like some of my colleagues in Nebraska didn't want me to leave Nebraska, they also knew I was traveling back and forth. So they would send me opportunities. So in other words, working your network so that they know, hey, here's where I really want to end up. You know, I, I love what I'm doing. But man, I have a friend who lo- wants to really badly be the marketer of Jones Soda. She has a great job, but that's really <laughs> what she wants to do. And she always shares that when she gives an introduction, which I think is genius. Because if I ever meet the man of Jones Soda, you can bet I'm going to walk I right know up. exactly who you need to I meet. I know who right? you need to hire. Um, and so I, sometimes I think it's just telling people what it is you want to do and how you want to get there. I just came. I had a student in my office who was pretty much a lost soul as to what she wanted to do with her degree. So I started saying, you know, who knows what you want to do with your degree? If it's just your mom and me, that's not enough people Mm -hmm. uh, helping you look. But if you just start telling your friends or your colleagues or wherever it might be, that's just that many more people. Like I said, if I'd never told my minister, well, I don't live here, like he would have never connected me as well as he did here at Northwest. And that was just a random happenstance because he wanted to volunteer. (laughs) Gotcha. So, okay. So I want to explore this just a little bit more. So if I'm a college student or someone who doesn't have a lot of experience, you know, in in a work life mm-hmm. sort of situation, like who is my network? Who, who what what is my network or who is my network made up of? What I would challenge students to do is literally look at the university calendar. And when you look at the university calendar, see who is coming to here that is not from here. Because sometimes I think that's an easier audience to network with. Mm -hmm. So we had a speaker in last week. And what I challenged a group to do was reach out to that speaker. Go to the the lesson. 
but then also send him a direct message, whether that's email or Twitter, whatever it might be, whatever he says he prefers. Send him a direct message. Just say, hey, thanks for coming. I enjoyed your topic. Here's two things I learned. Appreciate you coming to Maryville. Because what happens is it's so rare that we ever just reach out and thank somebody without asking for anything in return that my experience has been I almost get a 100% response rate. Those people writing me back because they're like, gosh, thanks. And that just gets the students over that hurdle because they don't know that person, so they're not worried about what that person thinks about them. A lot of times I think we're scared to tell our friends what we're after because we're scared they're going to be judged for saying, I mean, my yeah, you don't want to be the laughing stock of your friend group, right? Because right? right? I want to be the Jones Soda person, or right? <laughs> I want to be a professional state fair food yeah. eater, right? Like this is still my dream job. <laughs> if anybody has that job, see me. Travis well, wanted happen? to be yeah. independently wealthy. <laughs> yeah, so that was I'm, my answer. Yeah. There you go. Well, that too. Um, but I think sometimes on a college campus, if I look back at my college career, that's what I regret the most is I didn't take advantage of all of the speakers, all of the workshops, all the companies we bring for Career Day. I mean, we bring outside people in all the time. And those people aren't scary because they don't know you. They're never going to see you again. You get a clean slate with them. They don't know that you failed chemistry yesterday. <laughs> they don't know anything. They don't know you slept through your classes. Like, they just see a nice person who emailed me. So I think that's sometimes a safer audience to start with. Because then your other network is just everybody that you know. I like to call it spokes of influence. So if you're a wheel, how many spokes do you have? In other words, where are you getting your, your content from? Where are you getting your influence from? I always joke that's why I run marathons and ride motorcycles because those are two very different audiences. So I can sometimes bounce ideas off that you realize why things go sideways sometimes because a certain audience just doesn't even not, not think differently. They just don't think about that topic at all. Mm-hmm. So when you bring it up, they're like, I don't know why you're even worried about that. I don't even know what you're talking about. Gotcha. One other thing that I could add would be like, I'm trying to think about this. If I send somebody a nice note or something thanking them, right? If they're just like, ah, college student, throw it in the trash. I'll never know, right? No, I just never. send it off to you. I I will never know if they have a negative reaction to it because I'll probably not hear from them again. Right? Absolutely. I, so like to, I like to keep it's a list. It's really risk, risk. There's no risk at all. There is zero risk. And it's actually pretty fun because most of the time they do write back. More than once, I've sent it to a speaker and they're like, oh, are you still here? Because I'd love somebody to go grab coffee with or grab, grab a meal with because they're usually there by themselves. They know no one. So honestly, I've usually leveraged it way further than I even intended with just my nice thanks for coming kind of message. Gotcha. So on on that note, so if I'm it, say I have an interview or something, what's the what's the protocol that you would recommend for like following up with a thank you or what do I do? What if it's a quick turnaround time? What, do I still send a thank you note? What do I do? What's I know it's philosophy it's, on that. It's such a toss up because. With the instantaneous that we all have phones in our pockets right now, I always encourage students to go ahead and send that email. If they've if they converse with you via email, send the email. Or if they've conversed with you via text, send a text. You would as whatever format they converse with you with. But I still, send it back to them. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I gotcha. still always send a handwritten note anyway. Because I'm hoping, like right now, I sent our career day email right before I walked over here. I already had thirty six out of office replies, which means those people are all at career days. So they're already interviewing kids. They're already getting those instantaneous notes. But at some point, they're actually going to go back to their physical desk. And I would argue they're not getting that many handwritten notes there. So I want to be the person they like right and away. And they're tired. And they're being tired. Career day. And so then they get back and they have these nice notes. I would argue, yeah, they're going to recommend you to their bosses. But if they get back and they have this beautiful note from you, they're probably likely to be like, wait, don't forget about John Smith. Like, look at this great note I got from him. Like Again, and if not, they're just going to throw it away. So what do you got to lose besides your <laughs> postage? Is it possible for you to follow up too much or send too many emails? Is that a possibility? Absolutely. You got to be really mindful of when it actually closes. So like maybe they interviewed you, but it doesn't close for three more weeks. Maybe they just got an open interview process. Like calling too soon can definitely be a problem. I usually suggest when they say, do you have questions? That's the question you should ask. What is the next steps in this process? Because if they say, we're going to make a decision by Friday, well, then you know, dang, I better send that thank you like the second I walk out of here and I'll hear by Friday. If they say, we're just openly looking for good talent at any time, well, that's when you need to say, okay. Because it's customary to follow up in that two-week mark, but they might not have made a decision by then if they have an open policy. Could I write my thank you note and like leave it with the secretary downstairs? Is that a, can I do that? Is that a thing? I always think that's always a little awkward because I don't ever know what that secretary's role is in the process. So like, I actually like to go, I'm probably like overkill on the thank you notes. Let's be honest. You both know me. (laughs) So I would actually, if I'm the candidate, I'm trying to find out the secretary's name and I'm trying to have a conversation with her about something on her desk because I want to send her a thank you note too. 
So I don't want to leave gotcha. it with her because I'm going to send her one as well. Like, so glad to hear about your daughter, Abby. Hope she got into grad school. Because I would argue that person really has all the power, literally, um, because they do the schedules. They do the calls. So if they think you're delightful, well, then they're also going to advocate on your behalf gotcha. on why you should get hired. Gotcha. Absolutely. That's a good point. So you mentioned networking and how important that is. Uh, you're one of those people, I'm sure networking just is second nature to you. <laughs> we have our moments. <laughs> yes, that, that's not always the case. You know, no. I, I struggle severely with network. So what tips do you have for those those poor introverted kids like me out there who uh, know they need to do it, but boy, they, they like their don't network like of it. two, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm married to one as well. So I always <laughs> think three different things. One, do your research. So in other words, ask for an attendance list. Ask who might be there. Because if you're very introverted, or even me, in my previous job as a lobbyist, like that's too many people to visit with. Right. So I'd always try to get an attendance list so that I could reach out ahead of time. Like, hey, Sarah, I see you're also going to be at this insurance briefing on Thursday. I'd love to touch base with you. Do you want to just meet before or do you want to meet after? And just kind of set my own schedule, even though I'm perfectly comfortable in that big room of people. But I wanted to make sure I, I, I checked the right boxes. Two, I always tell people, look at the outside of the room. If you're all invited to the same function, you all have the same value. It's just a lot of time we always think we need to be in the center where all the center people are because they're usually the popular. They're your CEOs. They're all those people. But I have found in my tenure at all my jobs, if I work the outside of the room, a lot of times sometimes those are even higher ranking people who just burn out from the day. And so they're so thankful somebody just came up and sat by their table and started talking to them because you just alleviated their hassle. What I've also discovered is if you do that enough around the outside of the room, well, now those inside of the room people are like, who the heck is that? Like, why are they working in the room? I wonder who they are. And they'll come talk to you, and that's the place you want to be. Um, the other thing when you're networking, I spend most of my time trying to figure out how I can help. So I'm trying very rarely to talk about me at all. I want to get them talking as much as possible. So even if they say, oh, I wonder if there's a good barbecue place around here, or whatever meaningless things they might tumble out of their mouth, I'm trying to constantly figure out how I can help them because I want to follow up in that sweet spot of either immediately after, depending on if we're at a conference, or like four days later. Like, hey, you know, we met briefly at the XYZ fundraiser. You mentioned your student, my, your, your son or daughter might be interested in becoming in a robotics league. You know, I got a friend in that. I just thought I'd pass that along in case that's helpful. Great visiting with you, Jill. Because you send that as a card or an, an a email, email usually. Okay, gotcha. And what I found is people are so one shocked that you remembered. And two, that you reached back out, that's, that's usually who I have the longest relationships with. And it's honestly a whole lot less scary to network if you're trying to figure out how to help than trying to figure out what's coming out of your mouth. Absolutely. Because if you're worried coming out of your mouth, you're always worried, like, did I say something taboo? Did right. I say something off of color? Did I say da-da-da? Instead, if it's all about, I just want to pry as much information out of you. One of my favorite questions to ask people randomly is, like, what brings you joy? What brought you joy this week? Because so rarely do we ever actually talk about that. Usually we complain about the weather, complain about politics. That if we say that, people are usually will share so much great content that then I got follow-up for days, depending on what tumbles out of their mouth. Gotcha. So you have like a whole system going on over there. I do. There, right? right. Again, that was my job before. So, and it is kind of still now. <laughs> <laughs> so that is helpful. Absolutely. So another thing that I think is, is really interesting, you know, talking to about people and kind of how they got on their career path. I know for me, like the, the jobs at Northwest that I have had, they were kind of big swings. They were, uh -huh. I'm going to take a swing at this. And if it happens, great. If it doesn't, was that your experience too, where you just kind of took it, you, you know, it wasn't on a plan or anything. You just, I'm going to try this and see how it goes. I still yeah. We're have, polling people. I still don't how many have people have a plan. <laughs> right. None of us have a plan. There are I, no plans. There are no plans. <laughs> plans are meant to be broken. Anyhow. Uh, the student that was just in my office, she was really worried. She's looking at job descriptions. I'm not qualified for any of these. And I, I said back to her, who says you're not qualified? Like, did you say you're not qualified? Like, that's not your job. Your job is to look at the minimum qualifications. And if you're meeting them, apply for it. And she kind of looked at me like I, my hair was on fire. And I said, well, for all you know, you're more qualified than every other college graduate who wants to go into that specific field. So why would you want to kick yourself out of a pool when you could be instrumental for that organization? Absolutely. So that's usually more what I talk about is shoot, I still swing from the branches sometimes, not on jobs. I love what I do here, but more on committees or organizations. I'm like, what's the worst they're going to do? Tell me no. Okay. That's a good point. Absolutely. In my interview, when I was really thinking like I'm very underdressed, not, not that I was underdressed for the interview, but like in general, like career services seemed like the suit people. And I was <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going to struggle with being a suit person. We're but, not suit you people. Know, no. I got it. <laughs> I kind of feel more comfortable now not being a suit people. Right. 
I would still prefer a polo. I was meant to be, I joke, the girl that travels around with the John Deere tractor and like, next up is the John Deere. Da, da, da. Like, so you can just <laughs> let me wear like khaki pants on a polo every day. I thought day. it was polka dots. Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, any other advice you'd like to share with students or? No. So, well, besides come to career services, yes. really do not do as we did. <laughs> do as we say. Uh, really just let people know what it is you're looking for and swing from the branches. Say those big audacious schools because you don't know who we know. Or how we might be able to connect you. So, you know, I say say to the lady in the grocery store who asks you, hey, how's your day? Oh, it's good. I'm applying to be blah, blah, blah. Let total strangers. I'm looking for a job as a blah, blah, blah. Maybe her brother does that. And she's like, oh, hey. Right? You never know. So, you know, throw it out there in the world. Just you never know. All right. Excellent. Any awesome. final thoughts, Hannah? Thank you, Jill. I Any super time. appreciate you. you. You are like our guinea pig. Of course, we <laughs> guinea pigged on each other, but then, of uh-huh. course, we know we can always ask you to be a good, I feel a good sport, right? Yes, always. Anytime. All right. Well, that was Behind the Bearcat. Again, thank you all for listening, and we'll be back and talk to you next time. <laughs>